section 4.1. I'll decide if I like that light or not. We'll go with that. All right, 4.1, which is talking about exponential functions. All right, so an exponential function represents the process of either growth or decay. So we're going to do a little college algebra or algebra for STEM um, review just to remind you of what an exponential equation or function looks like. So of course, an exponential equation could be y equals bx. And we know that b is your base, which is going to be some number. And then, of course, here, it, x is your exponent, which is going to be a variable. All right, so we can write that as a function. It would be f of x equals b raised to the x. Now, depending upon the situation, the problem, it could also be f of x equals b raised to the t, where t maybe represents time. But it's in essence still an exponential function. Now, the base b, <clears throat> you have two different situations. So, well, first of all, we know that the base has to be a number greater than zero. So we're only looking at the base where it's greater than zero. And we're gonna look at two different scenarios. We're gonna look at when that base is greater than one. So of course, if you're looking at a number line, we know it's bigger than zero. So right now we're looking at all of those that would be anything, the base is any number bigger than one. All right, so we're going to look at f of x is equal to 2 raised to the x power. So if I got tried to get an idea of what this would look like on the graph, I could say, OK, I'm going to let x be equal to 0. So if I put in here, I'd have 2 to the 0, which is 1. So 0, 1 would be right here. And then if I said I'm going to let x be 1, it'd be 2 to the first power. So that would be 2. So I would go over 1 up 2. So I can get an idea of what's going on here. I'm going to go ahead and do x. The exponent is negative 1. So if I had 2 to the negative 1, that would be the same thing as 1 half. So negative 1, 1 half. So what you get here is the ex exponential function graph that looks like this. Now, if you'll notice, as you go from left to right, it goes up. So this represents growth. You'll see this in a lot of financial type um, problems and situations. Now, one thing too is that point zero 0.01 will always be on this graph. Because even if this was 10, 10 to the 0 is 1. If this was 25, 25 to the 0 is 1. So 0, 1 is always a part of a growth exponential graph. Now we're going to look at when b is less than 1. So it still has to be bigger than 0. But now I'm looking at these numbers in here. So between 0 and 1. And we're going to look at what that graph looks like. And I am going to use f of x equals 1 half raised to the x power. So we're just going to find some points. I'm going to start with a 0 again. Anything to the 0 power is 1. So it as well has 
zero, one. So this point right here, zero, one, whether you have growth or whatever this one's gonna look like, it is still always a point on the graph. Um, one, one half to the one, first power is one half. So over one, up one half, negative one, one half to the negative one, I can flip that one half to be two over one or two. So I have negative one up two. So now this is now decreasing. So this is a, a graph representing decay, okay? Now, before we get into the main types of problems that we're going to be doing, um, I just want to give you a heads up. In WebAssign, um, you're going to have some problems on uh, plugging some things into the calculator. And of course, we're going to be doing that as well, um, just to get practice on the calculator. You're also going to have some questions that deal with the exponent rules that we learned back in chapter one. Um, you know, when to add exponents, when to multiply exponents, when to subtract exponents, how do you handle a negative exponent? So there's some of those questions in there, um, but you should be able to handle those just fine. Now, exponential functions gets introduced and is in the financial world a lot. And one of those that we're going to talk about is compound interest. And this is money that is invested at compound interest. We know it grows exponentially. Now, compound interest when invested, it grows, gets bigger exponentially, which is a good thing. Now, if you ever borrow money and they're calculating your interest on co compound interest, interest, that's not a good thing. Okay, so one of the first ones we're going to look at is uh, when we're looking for future value. Now, your book will label this as value after T years. So what is the value of your money after two years, after five years? Well, that's what's the value of your money in the future. So that's why I also call it future value. So the formula for this is P, open parentheses, one plus R over M raised to the M times T. Now, you gotta know what these letters represent. So P is gonna represent P dollars. So it's an amount of money. R is your rate. T is your time in years. Now this is what you have to be careful of. If they tell you three years and you just use three, but if they tell you 36 months, then you have to convert that into years to be three years. If you use 36, the formula is going to assume you're talking about 36 years. And then we have M and M is how it is compounded. So if they tell you it is compounded annually, then M is one. Semi-annually, then M is two. Quarterly, it is four. And monthly, it would be 12. So you're gonna have to read the problem and in order to know which one to use, okay? All right, so let's look at an example. Find the value of 
of $5,000 deposited in a bank at 5% for 72 months compounded. We're going to do part A. We want it compounded annually. And then part B, we want it compounded quarterly. Okay, let's first take a look at the information. So here is your P dollars. So P is going to be 5,000. And of course, percent, that is going to be your rate. And I'm gonna go ahead and write that as a decimal. And then 72 months, so be careful, T is not 72. If I put T as 72, it would represent 72 years. So take 72 divided by 12, and that would be six years. So part A says it wants compounded annually. Annually is one, so I know for this problem, M will be equal to one. So now we're gonna put it into this formula. So it will be 5,000, one plus 0 0.05 over one raised to the one times six. Now you can put all of this into your calculator, 5,000, open parentheses, one plus, now we know anything over one is just 0 0.05, but I'm gonna go ahead just because some of them you're gonna need to use the fraction button. So I just want, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. All right, now we need to raise this. So I push this up arrow and it's gonna be one times six, or of course you could do that in your head. And we are talking about money normal rounding rules, two decimal places. So what this tells me is if I place $5 into an account and it earns this interest for six years, then in six years in the future, my money will have grown to $6,700.48, okay? So, um, okay, part B, we're gonna do all these same numbers, but now N is going to be quarterly. So it's 5,000, one plus 0 0.05, but instead of one, we're now gonna use four raised to the four times six. So we're going to see which one will yield more money. So in this scenario, you'll have $6,736.76, which makes sense because the more often it is compounded, it can grow faster. Just like if, I, if it was compounding monthly where M would be 12, we would get a number even bigger than this. Semi-annually where M is two would be a number somewhere in between these two. So that is your future value. Oops, sorry. We're also going to look at present value. Basically, we're going to be doing the same type of problem that we did, but it's kind of in reverse, so to speak. So now we're looking at to have so much money in the future
how much would need to be invested now. So here's your present value, okay? So now we're gonna say, okay, I'll have $10,000 in the future, so how much do I need to invest today in order to have the $10,000 in the future? All right, so that's how it is different. So that formula Now, in the book, it gives you P over one plus R over M to the MT. So if you'll notice that this is the same, it's just now in the denominator. Well, I like to look at it as this. This is in the denominator. So what I'm gonna do is bring that whole thing up and change this to a negative. And I'm gonna use this formula. And if you'll notice, it is the exact same formula as the one we just used, but now this is negative instead of positive. So the key is gonna be knowing when do I use the one with the positive exponent? When do I use the one with the negative exponent? So let's take a look at an example so you can kind of start seeing the wording and hopefully get familiar. So find the present value. of $6,000 to be paid in eight years from now at 10% compounded semi annually. All right, so of course we know this is going to be our P, so that is our dollar amount. We know that eight years is our T. Ten percent will be our rate, and m semi-annually is two. But what you have to watch for is this eight years from now. Six thousand dollars to be paid eight years from now. So this is going to be paid in the future, which means I want to know how much do I need to invest today to have $6,000 in the future. So that tells me I need to use the formula where we have a negative exponent. All right, so 6,000. One plus point one over two raised to the negative two times eight. So we find that I need to invest two thousand seven hundred and forty eight dollars and sixty seven cents today. And then with this rate and how it's compounded in eight years, this amount will grow here. Now, the biggest thing in this is knowing when to use which um, formula. So I'm gonna hopefully show you something that maybe will be helpful. All right, so you've got to determine is what I'm given P, do I have the money P now or is P gonna be what I have in the future? So if I have my money P now and I'm calculating the amount for the future, then I use this formula 
with the positive exponent. If the P represents money that I have in the future, and I need to know how much that would represent now, same formula, but it is a negative exponent. Well, here's my hint. If I have this money now and I'm going to the future, that's to the right. We usually think of things going to the right, positive exponent. If I have P in the future and I'm going to backtrack, going to the left typically represents going in the negative direction. So that is maybe a helpful hint for you. Also at this time, I'm going to tell you good news formula sheet for this chapter. So this formula sheet is posted in Blackboard um, in course material and assignments. And if you'll notice, here is value after T years. So future value, here's the formula for present value. So these formulas are the two that were introduced. Now, another situation where you will be using one of those two formulas is when you are looking at depreciation. By a fixed percentage. This these type problems are like compound interest but with a negative interest rate because when things depreciate, they go down. So that means that that is gonna to have to be a negative. Okay, so here's an example. Let's say you have a $30,000 car and it depreciates, sorry, eights, um, in value, by 40% each year. Ouch, it's a huge depreciation. How much is it worth in three years? Okay, now here's your hint on knowing which of the two formulas to use. The car now presently is worth $30,000. So this number right here is the amount of money we have now, which is our P. We want to know how much will it be worth in three years. So we're looking for its value in the future. All right. So it depreciates 40% each year. So your rate, because it depreciates, is going to be negative 0.4. Um, then three years, we know that T is three. And then this right here, each year tells you your M. So in this case would be one because each year just once a year. Okay. All right. So because this is the money we have now and we're wanting to know what it's worth after three years, I'm going to use this formula with the positive exponent. But the big change is you have one plus negative 0.4 over one, or with this being negative, you could just put one minus 0.4 over one, one times three. And so when you put that into your calculator, the vehicle that was worth $30,000 is now worth 6,480. Ouch. 
That's huge depreciation. Okay. Get those all dealt with compound interest. Now we're going to look at a topic called continuous compound interest. So the key here is this word continuous. So we have a different formula when it's continuous. So for these problems, there will be no M. Since it's being compounded continuously, just right after the other or the other, we don't have it yearly, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly. It's just continuous, okay? So we have different formulas. All right, so when you're looking for future value, or in other words, it's value after T years, that formula is P times E raised to the R T. Now, E is a number like or similar to pi. Um, it is a number that never repeats, never terminates. And you can research it, it's like 2.71 and then it keeps going. We're just not as familiar with E as we are pi, but it's a similar type value and it is used in exponential functions when we're dealing with continuous compound interest. Now, just like with the two formulas we did before, when I have future value, this is what the formula looks like or when I'm looking for the future value, I'm sorry. When I'm looking for the present value, it is P times E raised to the negative R times T. So it's just like the other. So when you have now and then the future, which of course the future means in T years, if you have P now and you're looking for the money in the future, then it's P times E raised to the RT. If you have the money now, P, and you wanna know what it, or I'm sorry, when you have P as an amount that will be what you have in the future and you wanna know its equivalent amount now or what would need to be invested now, then you are going kind of backwards, so it would be negative. So let's look at some examples. Oh, and these are on your formula sheet as well. And so the difference between these four formulas, these two deal with compound interest, so it will say things like it's compounded quarterly, so there'll be a value for M. Here, what you're looking for is it's the wording of compound continuously. When it's compounded continuously, you don't have the value for M. If interest is seven point two five percent with continuous compounding how much should you invest today to have $25,000 in 20 years. Okay, so when I look at this, typically P is very easy to find. It's just determining which direction am I going with my P. So let's pull everything out and then we'll take a look at that. Um, my rate, my time. Okay. 
it's already in years. Now I'm not looking for an M because it tells me it's continuously compounding. Okay, so it says, how much should I invest now? So I don't have the money now to have $25,000 in 20 years. So I'm gonna have $25,000 in the future. So I have to use the formula with the negative exponent. So I'm looking for present value. And so it will be negative 0 0.0725 times, oh, here, I'm gonna do this, years. All right, so let me show you where the E button is on your calculator. All right, on your calculator, if you'll look over here, this button, it's LN, that stands for uh, natural logs, which we will get into in chapter four, but I want you to look above it. It has an E raised to an exponent, so that's what we're gonna use for this. So I'm first going to plug in 25,000 times, and then to get to that, it's in green. So I do second, and then that button, and then in the exponent, I'm going to do negative 0 0.0725 times 20. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. And we get... $5,864.26, yeah, 26 cents. So this tells me that if I'm investing money compounded continuously, I'm going to need to put this much into the account and then in 20 years, it will now be worth $25,000, okay? Okay, also with financial things in this particular section, you're going to be looking at and asked to do comparing interest rates. This is also known as effective rate of interest. Okay, now when you are doing these comparisons, and I'll show you what that means here in just a second, but one of the things that you're going to do is you will let P equal $1. And again, we're not actually investing that $1, we're just doing it for comparison reasons. And you are going to let T be one year. So here's what we're going to compare. We're going to compare an account that has 16% rate compounded quarterly. And we are going to compare that to 15.8% compounded continuously. So we want to see if I'm going to invest some money and I have these two options, I want to know which one's going to yield me more money. So I'm going to compare them. Well, here's how you compare them. Now, because this one is compounded quarterly, then we know here that M equals four. So I'm going to use this formula to know its value in one year compounded quarterly. So my P is one, one plus my rate is 16%, so 0.16 over four, because it's compounded quarterly, raised to the four times one year. And so what you get is one point one seven. Let me double check that. Just want to make sure what I have written down is correct. Oh, so we get 
1.1698 rounded to three decimal places, so 1.170. So we're gonna, we'll do approximately, okay? All right, now this one is compounded continuously. So we're going to now for this one use this formula. And again, we're gonna use P is one times E raised to the 0.158 times one year. Oops, I just can't think of my calculator. So one times E to the 0.158, of course times one, you wouldn't have to do that but we get 1.171 approximately. Out three decimal places. Okay, now remember our initial investment was $1. So I'm gonna take away my initial investment and basically what this tells me is when I compare the two, these two values right here are what we call the APR, which is also known as the annual one year percentage rate, or it is sometimes called APY, which is the annual percentage yield. Now, here's why we will find the APR in comparisons. Because back in 1993, our government did a Truth of Truth in Lending Act because institutions would advertise on how to invest money. Well, there's so many different ways, compounded quarterly, um, effective, I mean, just all kinds. And so they said, wait a minute, consumers aren't gonna be able to figure each of those out to be able to compare. So we do this so we can look at two accounts. Here we're comparing apples to oranges. We do the conversions. Now I'm comparing apples to apples. And if I was investing money, this one has a slightly better yield. And so I would invest in this account. Then in this section, one last type of problem that you're going to have to do deals with medicine. So it is a medicine example dealing with dosage and absorption of a drug. All right. So what it tells us is the amount of drug remaining in the tissue uh, T hours later. So we know that when you take, say, Advil, so it's in my system, so in so many hours, obviously then it gets absorbed into my body and so it decreases. So that's what we're gonna be looking at. So here's that formula, it's F of T, and it is D times E raised to the negative KT. All right, so I'm gonna have to give you um, some values. So T is time in hours. D is your dosage in milligrams. And K is your absorption constant. All right, so here's an example. The drug, can't, okay. Cyclos, 
Okay, of course, now when I try to say it, I'm going to mess it up. So I'm not going to say it. <laughs> so we have this drug and it has an absorption constant of K equals 0 0.012. Find the amount remaining after two days if 400 milligrams was taken. Okay, so I'm going to start looking for what's given. All right, so dosage in milligrams, 400. K, okay. love it when it's given. Now, where you need to be careful is T, because they give us T in days, and it says T needs to be in hours. So, of course, two days is going to be 48 hours. So now it's just a matter of putting it into the formula. So 400, whoops, times E to the negative 0.012 times 48. So we're gonna get, I'm gonna go out two decimal places. So 224.86 milligrams. So you originally took 40 or 40, 400 milligrams. And after two days, it has been absorbed into your body. And this is how much is remaining in your system. Now, a good example is pharmacists need to be aware of this because when you have someone in the hospital and they're taking particular drugs because different drugs can counter with others, they have to know how much is still in your system. So they have to be aware and that's why they're so good at documenting when and how much you took because if your body hasn't had time to absorb it, they may not be able to give you a, another drug that might not work well with it. So that's an example of why this is, is necessary and used. 